And I think we are live. Okay, good evening to um, our Facebook and YouTube and hopefully Instagram friends. Um, we are so excited to bring you another part of um, our coronavirus series called um, Talk about um, topics that are relevant to Jew in the City and Project Makom. It happens to be that the recent TV series, Unorthodox, um, just has so much content for us to unpack and discuss. Um, if you haven't checked it out yet, a couple weeks ago, we interviewed a Project Mako member, Nechama Schweitzer, to talk about um, the parts of Unorthodox that felt like what she went through, that she saw a lot of similarity in her life. Other Project Mako members said the same thing, but how her journey took a different turn than the character in that TV show. Uh, she ended up reconnecting to Judaism, finding a beauty and a meaning in a life of Torah and mitzvot, finding a joy she never knew that was possible. Um, there is an incredible woman that I'm so excited to introduce you all to. Um, I met her several months ago um, at a conference. Um, she told me a little about her story and I just fell in love with it. Um, the truth is that I've actually wanted to cover this story for a while um, because what we like to do here at Jew in the City and Project Makom is we try to give you an honest approach. We try to um, be fair. We try to be balanced. We try to um, acknowledge the things that are going wrong and at the same time um, highlight all the beautiful things that are going right. And when there are problems, um, we don't want to just sit around and complain. We want to think to what can we do to make things better? So that's really what um, this evening is about. Um, and the topic that we're discussing is um, a Hasidic mom whose kids took um, paths in different directions um, and she unconditionally loves them all. Um, and that's sort of a, one of the themes that we see in um, Unorthodox. It's definitely a theme that we've seen amongst our Project Mako members. I would say a large percentage of them um, do not have supportive families, do not have parents, unfortunately, that are there you know, for them no matter what. Um, but that's not the whole story. That's not the full picture of what Hasidic parents are doing. Um, and we need some good news too. We need to see a more nuanced conversation. Like we said the last time, you will basically never see traditional media show a broader conversation. So that's what we're here to do today. So um, Fegalea, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. I'm excited to be here and thank you all for listening. Okay, so, um, so let's just jump in, I guess, to... Um, you know, some of the questions that we decided to talk about. When this is over, we will um, take some questions from, you know, the public as well. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your background? Um, where do you come from? And, you know, how did you grow up? That sort of thing. Yeah, hi. So my name is Peggy Leia Landau. Um, I currently live in Chestnut Ridge near Muncie, New York, but I'm, I've only been living here for five years. And, um, before that, I've lived all my years in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, New York, and uh, we are part of the Hasidic soccer community. Um, we have eight kids, wonderful kids. Um, some of them have taken different paths, not observant. Um, and I love every one of my children with every fiber of my being. Beautiful. Um, so, even as we were talking about what to call this evening, um, I mentioned the word OTD. Now OTD, um, for those who are not familiar with the term, um, stands for off the derech. It started originally, I would say, as a pejorative for people that were giving the people that had left observance a hard time for being off the derech, as if there is one single derech and they left it and it's kind of over. Um, my understanding, having spoken to many people in this community is that for a lot of them, um, they sort of reclaimed the term, um, just like you know the black community reclaimed the N word, that sort of a thing. Um, so, but you don't like this term, um, and so we didn't use this for our um, title. So, can you tell us why do you not use the word the term OTD? So, I just like to use the term not observe or have taken the blue paths. Um, my belief is that every person has their own journey in this world, and um, not every journey takes the same path. Not every child will take the same path as their parents. They have their own separate journey. For sure. How did you and your husband respond when your kids took different paths? So we were shocked in the beginning and confused, and most of all, we were hurting to see our child hurt. 
that was most of the most of the initial reaction. Yeah. So what did you do? Um, did you reach out for advice? Did you seek support somewhere um, after you know this change in your family had occurred? Yeah, definitely. So first we were trying to seek out for local advice and um, the advice that we were getting did not resonate. Um, I particularly felt that it was coming from a place of fear and not understanding. And so my husband and I turned to, uh, we first turned to our rabbi, which is Satva Rabbi, and uh, we asked him, what are we supposed to do? And he gave us two pieces of advice. Uh, the first one was um, try to connect to a guidance counselor that will understand your child. And the second one was no one can ever tell you to distance your child or send them away. And so with these two pieces of advice, we went to look for um, a guidance counselor. So I actually connected to families that have been having the same situation, a child or children that were um, that have chosen different paths. And um, they connected us to a guidance counselor. And this guidance counselor was just uh, understanding our child and helping us broaden and expand our home in a way of making it be a place for everyone. And so uh, this guidance counselor also connected us to a group of um, like 350 families that all of them have a child or children that have chosen different paths. And they all have loving, warm, united, um, accommodating homes for everyone's needs and where everyone has a place. And um, all I can say is that it's wonderful being a part of such people. I'm grateful. Are you comfortable to say, you said that, I mean, I think I understand from your illusion, I don't know if you want to go into it anymore, you said the initial advice that you heard did not resonate with you. Um, it seemed like coming from a place of fear. Would you be able to say a little bit about the initial advice that you heard that did not resonate or speak to you? Yeah, basically most of the advice was um, kind of uh, trying to, um, to navigate everything around our child in a way of manipulating them. And uh, it did not address our child's hurting. It was only basically addressing the fear of leaving observance. And I saw a different picture. I saw a picture of a hurting child that needs to disconnect for some reason. And so the advice just did not resonate. I, I didn't feel like it was doing any good. I want to reach to the screen right now and just give you a big hug because um, I, I love that. Um, I mean, your, your love and your care for your kids are is so palpable. Um, I, I'm going to ask the question, but like, I think I know the answer because meaning we're dealing with the people that parents just took that advice, the advice of to manipulate and try to keep them in. So what, like, what, what made you go against that? I guess, is it just Seichel? Is it a heart? Like, how do you know to say this advice does not speak to me and I have to seek out another opinion. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, you I do understand I I have to think for yourself and say, I will not accept this as a possible uh, answer. I must find another way. Okay. So innately, first of all, every parent has dreams for their children. Yeah. So um, some of the dreams are for the sake of the child. Some of the dreams are honestly for our own sake. Yeah. Our own um, impression, our own dreams, our ch uh, our dream of wanting our children to kind of be the same as uh, we lived our lives, live the same kind of life we lived. Um, well, many dreams or most of the dreams are for our children, but being that a lot of the dreams are all also for ourselves, it's it's very hard to let go. Mm -hmm. And so when a parent sees that their child, you know, some parents have a dream of their child filling the part of the life that they could not, like filling their, like doing all the opposite stuff of their own weaknesses, their weaknesses that haven't been yet able to overcome. They want their child to kind of represent the opposite. There are all kinds of dreams that parents have. They're, and that's, that's something that's universal. Some parents have dreams of their child being a child prodigy, and some lawyers and doctors have dreams of every one of their children going to law school or medical school, and it just doesn't happen. Right. And so um, when a parent sees that their child is just not taking up their dream, it kind of feels like a loss. 
and it feels like you need to grieve your dream. Yeah. And actually that is a very healthy and good thing. Grieving the dream lets you let go and go ahead and accept reality. Some parents have a very hard time doing that. Mm -hmm. um, I'm the kind of person that does not operate on denial for too a long time. And that is not something that I'll credit myself for because every person's brain works differently. Some brains need a lot of time to process and so they will be in denial for a long time because that's what their brain um, needs for themselves. So automatically the person is just gonna operate that way. But I usually jump into reality very quickly and I've seen that my dream is just not, you know, the dream of having children that are uh, observant, that was my past dream, it's just not happening. Yeah. And so I, I did grieve that dream but I knew that in grieving my dream, I'm losing the dream. But the last thing I would want to lose is my child. Yeah. I will not lose my child in my dream. And so whoever gave us advice of just navigating, working around our child and just pulling back on that, whatever imagination it was, I saw that I was just building uh, um, an anger and I'm losing my child and I'm yeah. distancing my child. And the last thing I wanted to do was lose my child. So that made me turn to other help. Okay, you said before you spoke to the Satma rabbi to, to get advice after that. Can you say, yeah. can you specify? I'm saying a Satma rabbi. Can you specify which Satma rabbi? Or? Uh, that was Aaron Talabam, the Munro Satma rabbi. Um, he was not able to give us any advice. He was honest. Yeah. And he just said, connect to a guidance counselor that understands your child, but no one can tell you to dismiss your child or send them away. Okay, but that, that's huge advice, though. That's huge yeah. advice to tell you to... Um, not not uh, lose your own children. So that's that's really amazing. Um, okay. Um, so so you reached out. So we'll get back to your story now. You reached out. You found um, a guidance counselor. You found a family of support. So you said there's 350 other families just in this group that you're in um, that are dealing with something similar that are fighting to keep um, the bond alive with their children. But um, the reality is that there could be other Hasidic parents out there that are not part of the group. By the way, I'm sorry for cutting in. They're not fighting. They're enjoying. Okay, fine. Okay, I thank thank you for the clarification. Meaning, like doing, meaning not not. Is is it the easier approach to is distancing the easier approach? Like, do you know what I'm saying? No. Like, no, no, it's the harder. Uh huh. Uh huh. So you're saying the natural thing. You're right. The natural thing is to not let your children go. Is to find a way to continue the bond. Okay, I appreciate the correction. It's good. It's good to have this language. Um, what do you think pushes children to take different paths? Are there any patterns that you've seen? So that's a great question. Um, I'll just give a little introduction to this answer, and that is that Judaism does not is not meant to be um, observed by by rote or by fear. Um, Judaism can be and should be very joyous and Jewish law is very adaptable to life situations and should never be painful. Um, and after the Holocaust, our grandparents were so afraid to lose their heritage and did not, not have parents to turn to to ask their questions and discuss their concerns. And so they taught their children a kind of Judaism of just obey and don't ask any questions. And that's more like a survival Judaism. So if any parents that are listening feel that they're still stuck in a Judaism of fear or rote, then I would definitely advise you there's a huge world out there of websites and, and places that you can learn from and expand on your own Judaism to enjoy what you're doing, get to understand, ask your questions, and just not be stuck. Um, mm -hmm. But even if you do enjoy your Judaism, it does not necessarily mean that your child is going to enjoy what you're enjoying. Mm -hmm. um, as I said, not all doctors have children that are in the medical field and not all musicians have children that have a musical ear. Mm -hmm. um, it just doesn't always happen. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna ask, answer this question. Um, uh, every child needs two things that are very important or most important for them in order to grow healthy, um, and productive and successful human beings. Um, the first thing is a loving and trusting connection with an adult in their lives, whether it's a parent or a caretaker. 
Um, love and connection means the child should be seen, heard, understood, validated, and uh, soothed when needed. And the child should always feel tr safe. Um, and the child should also be trusted by their parents, trusted that they can grow and thrive and grow successful people. A child needs someone to believe in them as well. So the first thing is a loving and trusting connection. And the second thing is stability. Now, we cannot always provide stability for our children. While we can try to make the best in our home, trauma does happen. Car accidents happen. Losses in family happen. Divorces happen. And quarreling between parents in front of the children also happen. Abuse sadly happens. Hopefully not at home, but it sometimes does happen at home. Um, uh, bullying in school by friends, by teachers, by caretakers, um, taking advantage of children in the name of religion and always putting them down and telling them that they're not good enough, um, scaring them or frightening them by a God that's always out to get them and stuff like that or anything that's too much and too soon on the brain in life is traumatic. Now, most kids will tend to keep it in. They will have a very hard time discussing it with their parents for many reasons. Most of, most of the time it's shame. Um, and then the other half of the time, usually, it's blame, blame inward. Why didn't I respond? Why didn't I fight for myself? Why didn't I answer to this bully? Why, do I, why am I always so meek? Um, why didn't I um, protect myself? Why didn't I run? Why didn't I tell this to my parents five years ago and kept them all the time? I can't say it anymore. Um, in, many, in many ways that they blame themselves, and especially if the trauma comes from a teacher or two teachers one year after the other putting them down, whether they can't do successfully scholastically or they have learning differences or whatever it is, the point is that they take it in, especially when, when anything negative comes from an adult, because the adult is probably right and smart, and I'm just the kid. Within the years, this festers in them, and it hurts. And they just start to get a feeling of wanting to disconnect from themselves. And so if a child uh, is in need of disconnection, it may appear as being spaced out of school, um, not being able to concentrate, um, uh, being overactive, arranging all the troubles, um, being just um, callous at home and everywhere where they are. And that's usually for younger children. And then some kids are just going to be so connected to school time all the time. Um, and older kids might engage in um, unsafe behavior or addiction just before to that. Before that. And so, so as a child, child uh, is feeling what they're feeling. Um, so basically, uh, the question of, is there any, um, um, do you, any way that, that uh, a parent can see that the child is hurting? Yeah, it's usually very, very obvious and it can be obvious in many ways. Um, and, and by the way, one of the ways of disconnecting from your past or anything that bothered you in your past is disconnecting from the religious observance that you grew up with. So yeah, so when children are are hurting, the parents can definitely see um, the behavior that they're they're pulling away. Um, and I agree, sort of um, detaching from everything and just showing them that uh, you love them unconditionally, and um, that's sort of the first priority. That's what we found here. Um, I guess if I could jump in for a moment here, um, we've taken on a little bit of a parenting role at Project Macomb um, in that because so many of our members are missing that love at home. They're missing that place to feel safe. They're missing that place to be heard. They're missing that place to be validated um, and loved unconditionally. What we found is that we can create that amongst our community. Um, we can create that amongst um, the Shabbos hosts that our members go to, um, and they can start to become part of families um, and essentially get adopted into homes where um, there is that dynamic where they can watch the kids, um, you know, uh, be treated that way and get treated that way themselves. Um, and everything that you're saying is totally resonating with me because this is um, the healing process that we've done with our members. Um, and we also see that um, it's a process that as they begin to heal as people, um, not all, but many of them are able to sort of confront 
um, the, the hurt that they experienced as Jews. All right, I'm gonna go back to the questions now. I can't hear you, remember? So I'm gonna go back to the questions. Talk about communicating under uh, difficult times, okay. Um, so what are some practical ways to show your children? Uh, actually, um, the question that you asked before is very important to address because um, going from, uh, you know, why children have that desire to disconnect um, to what can we do to help them and be there for them, that piece is also important to discuss. So I'm going to answer your last question first and then I'll go on to the next question, if that's okay. Um, so your last question was um, that, what advice would you give to parents when they see their child unhappy or distance themselves? or engage in unsafe or addictive behavior. So the answer to that is just to connect. Connect to your child all the more. Give them more time, spend more quality time, go out with them, um, go trips with them, each to their age, whatever is appropriate. Find their needs, find their, their interests, build with them and um, compliment them. Find what what find their positive part in themselves. Um, in younger children, you can connect to, with them, go out with them, spend time with them, and get the feeling of what's bothering them. But it is, and in older children, when you connect, you can also get to feel their hurt. But it's never necessarily important to know exactly what happened in the past or what is bothering them. I actually feel that. Um, I would never force a child or ask a child what has happened in the past if something happened and what is bothering them if something was bothering. I'd rather connect to them in a way that they should be able to find positive connection to themselves. And so then when they feel that they want to heal in anything on their past, they'll come forward with it and ask either ask for help or by a younger child, you can offer help and take them for help to overcome whatever is bothering them from the past. And it's never good to be forceful and never fear to be forceful with helping the child, especially in therapy, because sometimes it gets too much too soon and that's trauma again. And sometimes a therapist and a child, therapist and client don't just click and we need to try someone else. And when one needs to try someone else, they might need a break in between and might need time and space to process. So it's never good to force a child to help, but it's always good to forge a better connection to your child and try to give them fun. Fun raises the endorphins in the brain. Go out to them, get them gifts, try to see what they like, make them happy, bring happiness into their life because they've gone through something. Most of them have gone through something. Most of them, them are facing so much sadness every day in their lives. It's just not fair to force them to help when they're not ready and to, to impose anything on them. Just connect and get the feel of what they need. Um, in older children or children that are addicted to um, drugs, alcohol, unsafe behavior, I would recommend to reach out for professional help. Um, definitely, I do recommend try to get a hold of a good guidance counselor that should help you get things clear and maybe connect to other people that will be able to help you out. Um, uh, the connection between parent and child that is addicted can sometimes be hard, but know that the kids that are addicted to drugs or alcohol are the most sensitive, wonderful, warm, and loving people in the world. They have the deepest and biggest hearts, and um, their sensitivity usually brings them to need to disconnect this far, because addiction is addiction is um, distraction. Addiction is actually distraction. And the antidote to distraction is connection. And in order for you to connect, help the child find their positive in them and compliment them and show it to them and bring it forth so that they should be able to reconnect to themselves in a positive way. Addiction is usually the result of disconnecting from the past and positive connection takes you forward and gives you the ability to be able and to be able and open for healing. I can hear you again. I can see you again all at the same time. Okay, that was amazing. Can I just ask you, this wasn't a planned question. How'd you get to be so smart? Like, where'd, where'd you learn all this? It's amazing. Um, uh, I don't know, just along this journey in the past few years. 
You just you, you learned you went. I learned, you learned for the past few years, and also um, just experiencing life with my children and having such a close connection to them, I was able to see, um, you know, I was able to see what helps them and gets them going. Um, my children are very successful. They've all made made their life, uh, put their life onto track, and we were able to, um, you know. Go, in, go college, one is graduating, and the other one isn't college, the next one is going into college. They're really, really successful, wonderful people. I, I feel like I feel like Seichel is not something that you can teach. And you know what I see here is that when you have parents that are committed to um, making this work and finding a way to continue the bond and to help their children recover from whatever pain they went through, um, they're gonna find a way to do it. They're gonna they're not gonna give up on their own kids. It's really it's so tremendous and your passion is so it really comes across through the screen. I'm getting text messages from all these people I know. She's amazing. Okay, I can only do so many things at once. What are some Torah sources for loving your children unconditionally? Um uh, first of all, um to be able to love your child, before I answer Torah source, I want to say that to be able to love your child unconditionally, it is important to first grieve your past dreams, not to hold on to them, because that is a barrier in loving your child. And grieving means do whatever works for you. If you need, if you need to just cry it out, run it out, uh, go therapy, do whatever you need for yourself to overcome whatever is bothering you, uh, get to do that. So first, take care of yourself and let your dreams go. If you need to just write it in, in, in journal and burn your papers, do whatever it takes, but make sure to let go of your past dreams. And second thing, oh, but don't you lose your child in between. Just grieve the dreams and be open to accept reality. Um, second piece of advice is you need to be able to separate. Um, and only after you let go of those dreams and see reality, you could separate yourself from your child knowing that you have your own life journey and your child has their own life journey. And it not, it's not necessarily connected. It actually is not connected. Your child will have their own life journey. And when you're able to see yourself in your journey and your child in their own life journey, you're more able to embrace them and understand them. Um, so the next question that you asked, which was the Torah source, um, I can give one Torah source that I know. Uh, one of the last prophecies that uh, God gave uh, before the destruction of the temple was, um, I'll say the word in Ahavti Eschem Amr Hashem. I love you, says God. That was one of the last prophecies that Jews got in a time when they were misbehaving, they were idol worshiping, there was a lot of hatred and, and they just got a simple, unbelievable, loving um, prophecy uh, message, just, I love you. Um, and so the sages uh, had a great argument over this piece of prophecy, whether um, God's love is contingent on anything, is it conditional or not? And so um, they compared it to the love of a parent to a child, and uh, there was an argument, does a parent only love a child when the child fills their dreams, is obedient, um, et cetera, et cetera? Or also when the child is angry, defiant, um, uh, rebellious, etc. And the bottom line was that a parent loves the child no matter what, mm -hmm. which is unconditional. I mean, I think, um, you know, when I asked you this, I was also thinking this idea that all throughout the Torah, um, you know, the children of Israel, Israel are rebellious, are not listening to God. And. Um, the message again and again is that God is not going to forsake us, that kind of there's no matter what we can do. He'll always be our God. Um, he'll always love, you know, the children of Israel, that that bond will never disappear. Um, and I sometimes wonder for the parents that are so ready to, um, I guess one point that I wanted to say, we're focusing on a lot of positive, but like, you know, one of the things that the Project Mako members mentioned about Unorthodox was that um, the character at the end, um, handed Esti a gun, kind of like, go use this. So they said that that wasn't a, a, an actual physical thing, but they have had parents say, I wish you would kill yourself. I wish you would just die. I wish this would all be over. Um, so again, like 
so happy to hear um, all the good and the positivity and the healthiness coming from you. But at the same time to acknowledge like the deep pain when parents, um, like you said, don't grieve whatever issues they're having and are just sort of taking all of that pain out on the children and, and doing it in an unhealthy. The next um, question, is, why do you think some parents struggle to do the unconditional love? Um, so I think that there's a lot of fear. Um, as I mentioned before, living Judaism out of fear, uh, is a drive to drive away kids when they don't observe because, um, that's the perce perception of, you know, God is going to be out to get you or stuff like that, which is really not true. God loves your child unconditionally and you can allow to love your child unconditionally, um, no matter their status uh, or whatever. Um, so one of them is fear. The other one could be shame because people are so tied to their communities and uh, if things don't go so perfect, then they are so embarrassed that they have a very hard time to love their kids, um, which, uh, which is really sad because you know the love of a kid is uh, really uh, should be coming before your own profile. And honestly, I want to share with all of you out there: nobody's life is perfect. Everyone has their imperfections, and it is just so beautiful to be honest and vulnerable and be able to love your child. And um, the third very important thing that I um, find does not let parents get over um, that their dreams and love their child is guilt. Because they feel that, oh, my kid is not able to do this, to do that, because I must have, I haven't been there for them when something must have happened. Um, I might have been too pressuring. Um, I should have sent them to a different school. I should have realized that this teacher was horrible for them, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I would recommend highly, and I think it's very important to just recognize what went wrong, and even if you don't recognize, apologize to your child, be loving to them. And if you know what your mistake was, just don't repeat it again. Apologize and move on. Guilt is like a curtain in front of your eyes. You cannot love your child if you're carrying guilt all the time. Mm. Beautiful. Um, can you, to everyone here now is telling us, Fagalay should be a, a mentor to other parents. So. Great news, guys. She is. Woo. Okay. Um, so can you tell us how you've become a mentor to others? So um, one of my friends connected me to um, CORE when, when it started out. So CORE is um, a cohort, an international cohort of professional and lay leaders um, that facilitate and run circles of friends and community members. Um, they meet on a steady basis to learn and grow and support each other and basically connect to themselves, each others, and God. And um, CORE has a network of trained mentors and professionals to reach out to as well. So uh, I am a CORE Circle uh, facilitator and a CORE mentor. So I was trained in mentorship. Amazing. Can you tell us like how many you know parents or moms have you spoken to at this point? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> basically get uh, phone calls um, at a rate of four a week. Um, but I have a large family, so I would not advertise or go official yet. I want my kids to grow and things to settle, especially not in Corona time when everyone's home. Yes. <laughs> um, okay. Um, can you give us any anecdotes of how your kids or other families' kids have responded to this approach? Okay, so in the beginning, they were confused. Um, but as we explained to them that everyone has their own life path and for some reason, um, your sibling or siblings are not able to be observant right now. And this is the path that they chose, but we love them anyway. Right. Um, I cannot explain you, explain to you, uh, to people out there, how relieved my children were to know and to see and to live full acceptance of every child in the family. This actually brought them a subconscious message that they will be loved and accepted no matter what. Um, it's interesting that I've been seeing, um, I've been hearing this question a lot. What about the other kids in the house? Are they not going to choose this path as well? First of all, it's, it's very interesting to me. Uh, why should they choose one path over the other? Um, second, I have seen other children, you know, uh, choose um, 
a path of being not observant as well. Um, but everyone for their own reason. And so one was not even connected to the other. And third thing, interestingly, I've seen in many families that did ostracize or send away their kid and not allow them back home, that there were also siblings that chose the path of non-observance, observance. And actually I've seen an equal amount. Yeah. The only, the only difference was that the kids in an accepting home stayed close to their parents, had a bond with them, were able to overcome and settle into their own life, whatever it was in a productive life. And kids from um, a home that, were, that was full of friction and um, they were not allowed to speak to their sibling, what happened was that that child that also decided not to be observant cut off with their parents alone because they, they, they became very distant and they made contact secretively and quietly with that sibling that was non-observant. And so it was like a rift in the family and the anger um, just made everyone so miserable. My most important message that I want to bring, uh, I want it to come through tonight, um, I'll give to all. And I guess, um, I hope I'm going to hear you uh, better in a minute or so. Um, Allison, if you hear me, my screen says it says that you're muted. You might want to unmute yourself if you can. I don't know. Um, my message that I want to bring out tonight, my most important message is um, for the child. Every child deserves connection, needs and deserves connection. And it is as important to them as oxygen and as life. And so that parents should open themselves up to connect to their children in every kind and loving way possible. And second thing, every child and every person deserves a home. There is no way that you can make any child be homeless, no way. And to explain what, a, what I mean by a home, um, try to picture the uh, old fashioned scales that have a right and left side. So if you can imagine on the left side, the world out there with all its trials, uncertainty, tribulations, and hardships and fear, um, well, and also beautiful things, but the world on the left side and your home on the right side, your home has to be a place that your children should all have a space for their, themselves to live, to thrive in a way that feeds them, in a comfortable space that feeds them. And they need to have space to thrive there, every single child, in their own way, in order for them to have resilience for the world out there. And if parents feel that there's no way they can keep their child home, at least support them that they should have their rent paid by you and their utilities and an open bank account for all their needs met. And the child, yes, should have a place at home to come back to all the time, a warm place to come back to when needed. And I would say it's always needed. If a parent really feels that they cannot provide for their child and cannot keep them home, then go out with your child out there and find a place to sleep with them when they're out there and until you forge that connection and are ready to take them home. But you cannot make ch children homeless and without connection. And the third thing, third message is love your child. God loves them too. You can really allow yourself to love your child unconditionally. And then what I would want, want to really see is relaxed parents that really can enjoy living with and loving each and every one of your children. Okay, can you hear me? Oh, right now I hear you. I literally, this is so crazy. Okay, I'm going to just start asking you questions from um, the um, some of the people here. <laughs> Um, I saw one before I wanted to say, um, Mrs. Landau is amazing and fascinating. I never heard a Hasidic woman speak so intelligently and eloquently. I agree. Um, can I ask a question? Is the unconditional love a strategy to get them back or would you love them unconditionally, even if you know that they are never coming back? No, unconditional love is a strategy for healing and a strategy for healing your own heart as well. As, as you think that you missed something in life and as things change unexpectedly, it's just the strategy for healing and for helping your child connect to themselves so that they should be healthy, productive human beings. By the way, this is a very good question. Um, there are people that think that they need to send their kids to therapy to help them stay or be religious. This is wrong. I'm sorry to say, but this is wrong. Children that need to go to therapy because they're, they're hurting needs the therapist that understands that they are hurting 
and not to try to impose anything on them, but to help them heal. They will choose whatever they want to choose after that, if they will. But the first and most important thing and the whole um, idea of therapy or helping a child is let them heal. I'm going to see if I can pull out a few more questions. If you have any more questions, um, now is your time to ask it. Um, I'm just trying to think there's anything else that you want to close with. Um, okay. Hashem loves his children unconditionally. Um, let's say, Fagale, thank you for sharing your heart with us. Your wisdom has clearly been earned through so much pain and openness to growth. People here are crying. You're giving them, um, another view of, uh, the Satmar community. Um, okay. Someone wants to know that there are many people who struggle with disobedient children. It's not exclusive to Hasidim. Okay. Um, today's children need love and acceptance. All right, here. Let's see if we have any last comments. What about advice for a child with divorced parents? One side is religious, but the other side is not. Do you have anything to say about that? Um, what I want to say is that at least one healthy parent should connect to the child um, in a beautiful and healthy way. When the child will have a really strong and healthy connection, it is going to be up to them to choose. Um, Judaism and life is choice. We have free choice. And whatever we want to do or we don't want to do is between us and God and between us and our own lives. And imposing religion is not really how it's supposed to work. So just to build connection, they have to have one healing parent, one healthy parent to have a healthy and healing connection with the child. And it's up to the child to choose. Someone wanted to know if you feel like the child is a failure if they left Sotmer. I think you may have answered that before, but anything you want to say? Um, I mean, this is your kids have just even left Sotmer. They, they left observance completely. Um, so what would you say if someone thought that their child is a failure for not following the, the same uh, direction? <laughs> no, at all not. Um, that does not mean a failure. That means that the child took, took a different direction or path. There are many people out there that leave their, let's say, Hasidus and decide that they do want to have a connection to religion in their own unique way. We all have different fingerprints and we're all supposed to leave our own fingerprint in the world our way. And that's okay. That's actually, everyone, everyone is unique in their own way. And yeah, if someone feels that they don't fit into Safmar and they want to take, um, a different uh, turn in being religious, then it's just their way. I I really enjoyed um, listening to you. I know that our our crowd has too. We've gotten beautiful comments here along the way uh, for anyone uh, who's tuning in now. Um, we've just been having internet problems all day, maybe because there's a pandemic happening right now and everyone is online at the same time. Um, but to, I think starting maybe yesterday morning, our internet started getting very slow. I have to call the um, phone company and find out what's going on. Um, but I'm sort of between a phone and a computer trying to um, hear Fagalea Landau. Um, if you have follow-up questions, we will be able to pass them on to, um, to Fagalea. Um, she is home with her children. She is devoting her time to her children. Um, but um, you speak so beautifully. You speak so sensibly. Um, it is so clear to me that the stories that go wrong are for the parents that, um, you know, even the fact that, as you said earlier, the advice that you got, you knew it didn't sit well with you. That is, when I was in seminary, um, our rabbis taught us that the fifth book of the Shulchan Aruch, the Code of Jewish Law, is Seichel, is common sense. So you went to get advice. It didn't make sense to you. And you said, I must find out another way to stay connected to my babies. I will not let them go. Um, and you educated yourself on psychology. Um, and it's just, it's so wonderful to hear um, another side of the story, a broader side of the story. Um, we wish your family um, so, just so much bracha and hatzlacha and, um, and good things. Um, and I hope that for all the people here that are listening, um, that a few things. If, if you are coming from a situation where um, your parents did not meet your needs like the Landau's did, I hope this gives you hope that um, there are good people out there that are, now it's not work, as uh, Fagalea said, it's what comes natural to do what's right and stay connected and to know that that exists. Um, I hope that this video will get to parents that may be on the fence about how to proceed. 
um, and may think that the right thing is to influence their other children and to just follow the directions they were given. I hope um, that this beautiful, wonderful lady will help you reconsider um, another path to um, do whatever it takes to stay connected to your, your beautiful babies. Um, and I hope for the world that has only heard one narrative repeated again and again of what um, a Satmar Hasidic uh, family or a Hasidic family looks like um, in terms of these challenging issues, that this will broaden your perspective and understand that um, there are some serious issues out there and there is real pain, um, but there are also a lot of wonderful people that you've never heard of before. Um, and we're so happy that you, you know, were able to share uh, your your wisdom with us because that's really what I would call it, wisdom and seichal. Um, and it's really so beautiful. So thank you so much, and we wish you only the best. Thank you, and thank you all for listening. My best wishes to all. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you so much, everyone, and uh, keep watching JewInTheCity.com. Bye bye. Bye.